Um, I you know it's, most of you know probably that um, we uh, have lost a lot of members of our office. Um, we need you to be uh, patient with us during this transition. Um, we have roughly 40 people in our office in sponsored programs, and more than 20 percent uh, are gone basically in the last three four months. That's what happened. Uh, including our uh, both of our two team leaders for the award team. We are trying to replace them. We have gone through interviews and so on and so forth. Hopefully soon we would have replacements. Um, but overall, out of like roughly 40 people, we are, by the end of this, you know, next week, we are going to be down eight people. That's more than 20%. So um, things are going to get slower. Proposals, if they are not here early enough, uh, and unfortunately, this is an awful thing that I have to tell you. I guarantee that there would be a loss of deadlines. I mean, we would miss deadlines. It's just that simple. If things are not here, there are not enough people to work on them in a timely manner and you know, five minutes before the deadline. I uh, anticipate that we would miss deadlines. Hopefully, it won't happen. Hopefully, I would be wrong. But uh, that's realistic. You know, with 20% less people to work here and the volume increasing, uh, that's the expectation. So we need your help to help your uh, researchers, PIs know that this is where we are right now. We need advance notice of um, any proposal coming through. Um, awards are going to get slower. You know that, for example, in the negotiation team, uh, we are done at least one FTE, Sue Blair, who has been with the campus for quite some time retired at the end of last week. So we would go through replacement. Some other people are leaving and some other people have left. On the award side, I mentioned two um, team leaders. Aside from the two team leaders, two senior members of the award team um, are not here anymore in the last three, four months. In a sweep, Lawrence Berkeley Lab took four of our people. Um, for advancements, higher sal salaries, and all that, and we can't compete. Is that just the, that's the reality of life? I know that across the, com the, the campus there are some other transitions going on, but um, so I guess I you know, said enough about that. Any questions on that? Anybody who wants to come work in sponsored <laughs> programs? <laughs> uh, we are always um, looking for people with background in the departments. Obviously, We're just going back and forth is you know is good for for the campus too. So if you know anybody who wants to come to us, James, um, we are open for business. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So we have one take here. Anybody else? Uh, we have a question here. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so a question online says, uh, due to the short staff, can SPO send out an email to the deans or general list? We can tell our, uh, we can tell our PI that sometimes it takes a SPO email for them to hear and understand. Thank you very much. Uh, can they hear what you said? On they will in about 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, Let's, let's look into that. I'll, I'll work with uh, Mike and Randy to see what we can do. Uh, obviously, I don't want to start a panic on campus, but in the same time, it's a very good you know, uh, recommendation to look into to see what we can do to uh, uh, let people know where things are. Okay, thank you very much for that question, and we, we, we try to look into that. Um, James, do you want to give any updates? Sure, as long as we're sharing all this happy, fun, <laughs> wonderful. It's very, I guess, very quickly. Am I going to use the mic? Yeah, my stand right. We're almost in sync. Okay. So, um, last week we, uh, Amy Holzman's not here, is she? Rather, uh, she. Uh, right there. <laughs> um, Anyway, the, the NSF um, draft audit report has been issued to us, and we're looking at it. Unfortunately, they did not accept 
much at all of, of what we believe we had documented as being allowable costs. Um, so we will be back going through again and um, submitting a formal response within 30 days. Um, James, do you want I just to give an update to, on that? I mean, a background just, on that that some people might not know what was involved. Th so, so this was an, an audit that was uh, for the period of January 2008 through December 2010, a three-year period of time. It's been ongoing for, uh, you know, it's in its sixth year now, seventh year now of us going back and forth. It was just delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed on the NSF OIG side. Um, they did a an across the board um, request of all transactions on NSF projects. It wasn't the typical type of audit where they would uh, review a handful of awards. They looked at absolutely everything. Did data mining and really targeted what they saw as areas of concern. And that I guess is you know really still what was coming up in the report. And I thought I'd just mention what still exists in the report understand that we believe we still have a case to debunk um, some of some of these um, question costs as we move through this final process and then go to audit resolution um, which is where we've seen the other campuses have also come in with large findings that have been uh, mostly cleared through the audit resolution process where we go and um, present to NSF, other officials at NSF, why we believe the costs are still appropriate and allowable. Um, the total dollar, just <laughs> what they're what they're putting in their report as of right now is, uh, well, where's the darn bottom line? Two million four hundred ninety-seven thousand dollars which is just about what they had originally um, done when they, when they first came out. A large, large chunk of this has to do with the two-month limitation on NSF salaries, the summer salaries. Again, we believe, you know, Mike Legrand and Amy Holzman prepared a huge um, um, response and really demonstrated why they were incorrect in what they were finding, but it's still in here. Um, but. You know, I guess the, a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight is, is things that we know are always looked at in audits. Cost transfers, especially cost transfers at the end of project periods, and especially cost transfers after project periods have ended. Because this is really giving, a, 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 it, it raises the concern that all we're doing is trying to use up the funding, right? So we do want to, some of those are, of course, legitimate. Um, some of them might be understandable why the auditors are, are scratching their head. Again, at the end of a project period, um, they, they question equipment purchases that were being done at the end of a project period within the last 60 days. Now, we have an internal university process to review those requests, right? And, and so, in this case, I don't recall, you know, this has been stretched out over so many years. I don't know the specifics here uh, of what we were able to document. But again, we'll be going back on that. Um, the the equipment, the, the, there was a, a case where there was a significant equipment purchase. I think it was more than a third of the, of the total award was not in the budget. Now, we know that NSF has a lot of budget flexibility. But it really begs the question of, um, was there not a scope change involved here? I mean, how do you spend a third of the project on equipment when the project was intended largely to support graduate research and, and this type of thing? So, and, and then we couldn't document any approval for, for doing that. Um, equipment that came in after, after the performance period. I mean, if you receive equipment after a, a project has ended, how can that benefit the project? Um, it's, it's these kind of issues that, that, that are going to be real. Some of these are going to be hard for us to really dispute. I mean, some of them are just mm, not, so, not so good on, on our side. So, and again, that's where we really look to, to you all, um, to the departmental campus administrators, research administrators, to help and, and work with your PIs and help them understand how these rules work and, and why we do need to have 
costs that are allocable to the projects that can clearly be demonstrated to have benefited the project. Um, allocation methodologies. There's um, there are questions in here about why did you charge? You know, you split a charge. How did you come up with that split? What's the basis of it? Did you just like flip some? You know, again, it gives the appearance. What are you doing? Are you just trying to use up some money? Um, you know, I I, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and, and documenting this. Get, getting it down in writing. How did you come up with the allocation? You know what the what basis of it is. Um, you know, at, at the time you're making those entries, sometimes we go back and you know the the department administrators and the faculty are kind of scratching their heads and thinking, yeah, I remember we did that, and I think we did it because of this or that reason. Uh, doesn't I don't think it carries quite the same weight when you have somebody saying five years after the fact I seem to recall this is why we did what we did versus something you could document that you recorded in your files at the time that you were actually making the split charge or whatever whatever the case is. Um, those were those are the ones that I, I kind of wanted to highlight as where we could you know. We always need assistance. Again, uh, contracts and grants accounting. You know, we do a a, a review of the expenses. We are, we're questioning. We're we're trying to ask you when we see these things. How does this work? You know, help us help us understand how how this could be possible. Um, we have our queries that we run of the high risk object codes when we're closing out our projects. Those are cases where we want. You know, we may just be asking. We may just be saying. You know, I don't get it. You might, you know, help us understand. We may be saying something a little bit stronger, like, this really doesn't look allowable. <laughs> you know, you may need to get this off of here unless there's something really, really special going on. Um, but that is just part of our process. But but please, I, I do understand that, that in a lot of cases, it is a question that we're asking. We had a case fairly recently where, where we asked the question, um, I think it was some like fellowship types of charges that we were seeing that didn't seem, you know, they, they just showed up in our list of things that, that didn't seem right. The department simply executed a transfer, moved the costs off, and then a few days later said, oh, wait a minute, actually I think those were allowable And now that I think about what the award was for. But at that point in time, you know, we're months and months after the Charges were originally initiated, so now we've got a late cost transfer if we want to move the charge back onto the agreement. So those are the types of things that are also kind of hard to explain. What are, how are our controls working here? Who's, who's making these decisions? Um, boy, this is, a, this is a fun morning, isn't it? <laughs> There's more to come. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so that's, um, I don't know, any? Any any questions, comments? Have they have given morning. us some time to respond. Obviously, we have thirty uh, thirty, so we have to respond by May twenty third. Right. So. So it took all that time, and hopefully we would. Have, uh, well, yeah. hopefully these numbers would come down. In other campuses, they have come down substantially. I don't know if we can bank on that, but was it um, Santa Barbara or Irvine? So that's $6.1 million in Santa Barbara. So we can. Yeah. How much is ours? 2.3. So we'll see how it goes. It has taken a long time. It went through a lot of review and so on and so forth. We are where we are now. Okay. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, cheering you. So, oh. <laughs> um, how about um, let's see updates on deadlines for proposals and so on and so forth. Uh, Chris, do you want to share with us your information, please, Chris? Oh, oh. Give me a charge. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, so, up, coming up on the proposal side, uh, there's some deadlines coming up for May. One of the biggest things that I want to remind everyone is on May 25th, NIH implements its new Forms D. 
D as in David. Okay, so it's really important that any proposal that you prepare for that deadline or after uses that application package. You can use it through the Cayuse system or you can use it through grants.gov. Let me just give a plug for Cayuse. It's a very user-friendly, easy system to learn and use and gives you all your warnings, your validations, your errors at the time that you're preparing the application simultaneously. So I highly recommend if you have the time to please use Cayuse and see how user-friendly it will be for you. In addition, on May 7th, which falls on a Saturday, thank you, Mike, uh, which will be pushed then to the next business day, which is May 9th, there's several NIH deadlines. There's a lot of the R series, the, the T series, the T32, specifically the training grant, and then further on May 25th, again, is more of the R series, the T series, and the P series. So mark your calendars. Those will be busy times in our office, and we highly recommend that you prepare for them. As well as a lot of those who are in ag and environmental sciences, it's really important for those faculty to have their USDA funding. And so far, only small amounts of the USDA calls have been released. I check daily to see when they release the foundational programs, which have yet to be released. They keep saying on their website in April, and it's April 27th, and it's not released yet. So please stay tuned, look at their website, stay close, um, pay close attention to that because we're not quite sure when those deadlines will be due, if they'll be due two weeks, 30 days, 60 days, further out when they finally release them. But at this point, I know a lot of the researchers are interested in the foundational programs and they're not released yet. So hopefully by the end of this month or early in May, they'll be released. But right now we do have a few for May that are released and that are not part of the foundational. Um, one of them that a lot of people are interested in is the SCRI program. The pre-proposals for that will be due May 16th. So mark your calendars because it's mandatory that those pre-applications be submitted to be considered for the full submission, which I think is somewhere in July. <laughs> um, some of those that are coming in right a third deadline is the Wheat Yield Partnership Program. So get those in, pay attention to those guidelines. They're very specific. And uh, there's a lot of people that are interested in submitting to that. So unfortunately there's a fight for the money so make your application the best it can be um, and read the call it's very important the other one is the global change which is also due on may 16th that one's a high profile call so read that call really closely if you have any questions about the terms and conditions within the call or what you're supposed to do please feel free to call our office we're here to help you navigate you through the process to make sure that proposal is the best it can be in addition, we have NSF. NSF has about 10 different calls in May, um, ranging from enhancing graduate research, cyber learning, university and cooperative research centers, as well as scholarships, the STEM program, and the I-Corps program. Uh, so those are all really good calls to for your faculty if you're in the College of Engineering or Biological Sciences. I know there's a lot of faculty that submit for NSF in those departments, so check those out. Really quickly, there's one call that's coming up at the beginning of June. It's June 3rd. It's a NSF USDA call, combined call. It's call number, sorry, it's 16-549. That one is the cyber, is that right? Yeah, the cyber physical, uh, physical systems. It's joint funded between USDA and NSF. The proposal needs to be submitted via Fastlane. If you have any questions on how to prepare your Fastlane proposal, definitely call our office. If you're not used to Fastlane, we can walk you through that. Just wanted to give you a heads up on that one since it's a month out, but it's gonna be a little different. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, give us a call. Sherry, Cayuse Labs. Labs, every Thursday, please, if you're interested in doing hands-on training, preparing <laughs> your application, you have a faculty member that's interested in submitting a 
proposal via Cayuse, you can come to our labs Thursdays at 9 a.m. We can set you up. We can work with you one-on-one -on -one to get that proposal established and in the system and show you how easy it is. So please definitely send your emails of interest to the proposals at ucdavis.edu and we will get you set up. All right. Any other questions? Do you want to say something about the fact that once you have information in Caius, you can use them for future proposals and background information you put in there? No? You yeah. just said it. Okay. Professional profiles. <laughs> Professional profiles. Go ahead. So, so a lot of times um, what is very frustrating for administrators as well as researchers is that they're constantly entering the same information over and over and over in their application package. Well, with Caius, when you set up your profile as an administrator or as a faculty member, your information is in there. So you only have to do it once and it's golden unless you want to update it, which it's always available to update with any changes you have for your bio sketch, your current and pending. All that information can be updated and managed within Caius and you don't have to enter it every time you prepare your application package. It's already there for you. Thank you. Any questions from online? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to mention, first of all, the change. It's the due date, that's the driver. Yes. The Thank you. It's, it's the due date that is the driver. So, like I said previously, that if you have a proposal that is being submitted for the May 25th deadline, and you submit it either that day or before that day because of that deadline date is the 25th, you must use the Forms D application package. It's already available on the Cayuse website and they are updated on the grants.gov website as well. Okay. Good. Any other questions? There was one in the back for a second. Um, yes, good point. Thank you, Pat. What Pat said in the back, for those who may not have heard, is that because this is a co-funded NSF and USDA program, we know that USDA usually has a cap of 30% for their total cost, for their indirect cost allowable. At the time of the proposal preparation and submission via Fastlane, the indirect cost rate must reflect our negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. Then, if that project is selected for funding, and it's decided to be funded by USDA, we will then do a revised budget to adjust that budget indirect cost to the appropriate costs for that specific sponsor. So your direct costs should not change. Anybody have any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So you had a lot of um, uh, deadlines and so on and so forth. Uh, please add this information to what I told you at the beginning that we are done a substantial number of FTEs. One of them is a, uh, one of the uh, team leaders for proposals. That position is vacant. Um, Chris is taking care of both teams. Uh, typically when there are, you know, there's a heavy deadline, we also use individuals from outside the proposal team to help the proposal team. Guess what? This round, we don't have an enough bandwidth to do that. So I am just going back to what I told you at the beginning. You have to send the, the proposals in early, early, early. Five days might not make it work either in this case. It's just we really need your help. Um, if the proposals are here a day before, I don't know. Let's keep praying. Um, the, um, let's see. Um, uh, one other thing that, no quick, yeah, no, this, this is a nice thing. Uh, NSF, you know that we, we have been used to fast lane for a long time. Those of you who have been in this business as long as I have been, you have seen it for more than 20 years. Um, NSF is going through modern, modernization. I sent an email out to the campus last week that there is a webinar right after, actually this starts at 10. Um, there's a webinar uh, that you, you know, if you want to see that, um, if you are um, watching online, you probably have uh, registered for that. We have, um, we are going to watch it from here, but it won't be uh, telecast, it won't be on, online. For anybody who is in this room, if you want to stay, we are going to uh, uh, have the webinar here available for sponsored programs, people, and you are more than welcome to be here. So again, that starts at 10. They want to talk about how they are moving from fast lane to uh, research.gov and the benefits of it and all of that. So that discussion is going to go on. Um, 
Mike, you wanted to say something. So, uh, is that on now? You are going to have those on online. They are going to see this here very soon. It, it's, it's warming up. Um, well, so just going back, um, we submitted the fringe benefit rate proposal to the government first couple of, you know, April 1st, March 30th, you know, that week, whatever that week was, whatever that week was. <laughs> um, so we're, they're sitting on it, which I usually get the first emails from them about June 15th, June 28th, you know, because we have to do payroll in July. So they usually are a little bit behind. Um, we had some acts, we had over recoveries in prior years. So that was rolled forward into this year's rate. So they were down, um, from the previous projections that we had out there because we had to carry forward some over recovery. So the projected rates for next fiscal year are actually a little bit lower than what we had out as projections. So there's one good news for you guys today. <laughs> um, we are also still um, working on our f &A rate. This is our base year for that. So we are trying to finish up our space surveys. We are going through and looking at the A21 codes on all our accounts classifying all the sponsored and non-sponsored accounts into the right cost pools and bases for the FNA rate calculation. So if we come back and ask you, please kind of explain, you know, the descriptions of the accounts may not give us enough information to really know what's going on with those accounts. So we, Danielle and myself could be following up on what the accounts are really being supported for or what, what activities they're really supporting. Um, so we're really still focusing on trying to get the FNA rate in by next March, April-ish to give us about um, 15, 16 months of negotiation time before we go into provisional rate to keep that um, the, the smallest amount of provisional time as possible. And kind of like sponsored projects, the federal government's a little bit low on staff um, and they can't hire in the San Francisco office right now. That's a moratorium on San Francisco office. They can only hire in Dallas. If someone wants to go work in Dallas, I'm not. <laughs> Or um, they have a the new office in Salt Lake City, and they can haven't been able to recruit to those two places for um, F and A rate negotiators yet. So the numbers are a little small for people to see on the screen. Can you just make sure you tell them where? Oh, it's this is the uh, accounting and financial services the costing policy site. If you click on that, it does well, it does go bigger, watch. and then up in it, it goes a full size. And then there's um, the spreadsheets on the side to have with that with all the new um, use, was it the t uh, career tracks tile codes that are in place so far. We've updated the top as we keep getting new career tracks tile codes. We've been trying to update the, those lookup files as well. You want to come over here? Yeah. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> my benefit tech. Um, that is still last year information uh, because it was it was um, we don't have the final rates from the government on if they make any adjustments. So I'm not going to give you the breakout until we get the actual approved rates from the government. But so they're still projected for budgeting, but they're updated by what we submitted. So sometimes they do make some adjustments and carry forward adjustments and stuff. So the breakout. It's another calculation I do usually after, right after we get the approval from the government. So if you need to know how much is OPEB and retirement and Social Security and all the other breakouts, I'll get that soon after we get an appro approval from the government. That one. That's what I'm talking Okay. Yes. Um, I know one of the questions that we receive in sponsor programs quite often is, are you going to project out multiple years? <laughs> <laughs> or are they supposed to just use the 3%? Use, right now, I would use the 3% projection. We did do a lot of projections out early in the time because we had some, you know, you see the retirement system was going from zero to four to seven to 10 to 14 to, you know, a huge escalation to our cost. But now that we're pretty much capped and flat, at the 14% retirement, I think it's the normal escalation is going to work. The other caveat is sometime in calendar year of 18, we'll be moving to UC path. So there's a new fringe benefit rate structure that all 10 campuses are going to be using. So we're going to have to shove ours into the UC wide employee groupings. So um, 
over this next year, we'll be figuring that part out. And so we'll have 17, 18 might be part on ours, part on the UC path, or we might just try to transition everyone to the UC path rates. So no one really knows exactly what all those are, are until UCL, UCLA is the first campus to really go. I mean, they did it for OP, they're running through UC path OP, but they're not, I mean, they have one rate for everyone at OP. Um, they don't have the sponsored project issues to deal with, they can just rebudget within each cell. So UCLA is the one that's really figuring it out right now. Um, once we know what they're gonna go with, we will give you some more information on French benefit rates under UC path. And it kind of goes out of my hands and OP's taking over the whole thing, which <laughs> one last thing on my plate. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and other things, so. Anything else? No questions online either. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see, any updates from the associate directors? No, no, okay. I gave all, <laughs> and I gave all of the good news too. <laughs> any, anything else you want to talk about from here or online? It's 9.15 only, so you have lots of time. No? Well, if there's nothing else, then between now and 10, we have to do other things, and at 10, we would start the webinar, uh, the NSF modernization webinar. It's, uh, yeah, the, uh, the length of the webinar is from, it's one and a half hour, that's what they have scheduled for. It's from 10 to 11.30. Out. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I guess we can stop now. <laughs>